Thank you, Darren. Um, as you said, I am Denise. I am from uh, Dreamlift Studios. This is my Twitter handle is Raheli. Um, and these slides uh, will be available on SlideShare, uh, slideshare.net slash Dreamlift. They will be available at the end of the talk, so you don't have to rush to take notes. I want to start here with a roll call, just to see uh, you know, how many of you are here because you feel my pain. Uh, so how many of you are, uh, <laughs> aside from the people on my project? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many of you are here because you work on a project that's old enough to hold an account on a website under the COPA rules, a project that was uh, started in 2002 or earlier? Okay. Uh, how many people have a project that's old enough to vote, 1997 or earlier? <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, how many of you have a project that's old enough to drink in the U.S., 94 or earlier? Okay, I'm just going to keep going here until I, I drop you guys out. Uh, how many of you have a project that's older than Linux, 91 or older? Okay, wow. Uh, you know that saying, never trust anybody over 30? <laughs> Can your code be trusted or not? Uh, 85, 85 or earlier. Okay, how, how, old, how old are we doing here? 84. Okay. Mid 80s. Mid 80s? Um, I've seen a comment that was copied by 1984. I don't know if it was put before that. Okay. <laughs> so basically, uh, we've got some people who are dealing with some uh, venerable code going on here. 1956. 1956. Okay. So I am here, I'm going to be talking to you about, uh, mostly in a web context, uh, so I want to introduce you to DreamWith. You've probably heard about DreamWith from a social end, but I want to talk a little bit about our technical end. DreamWith is a code fork of LiveJournal.com. Uh, we forked from LiveJournal in 2008. LiveJournal uh, began in 1998-1999 or thereabouts, so when we forked the code it was already nine or 10 years old. And we had a really long debate about it because my business partner, Mark Smith, and I uh, really debated between ourselves about did we want to fork LiveJournal and use that as the basis for DreamWith, or did we want to start from scratch and build something that was the second system? When you have a second system, you get second system syndrome you've got a lot of arguing about what the second system should look like, and you lose a lot of benefits. And the benefits that we had to forking the code is that Mark and I had both worked on LiveJournal for a very long time. Uh, you know, when you look at the code and you're like, what idiot wrote this? And then you go over to get blame, and you're like, oh, that idiot was me. All right, then. So we were dealing with a lot of really complex code in there and a lot of uh, obscure stuff. Um, but we were the ones who had made those decisions for the most part, so we kind of knew what we were dealing with. And the other benefit to forking LiveJournal instead of starting over was the feature richness. Because yes, the code was 10 years old, but that was 10 years worth of development. It was 10 years worth of bug fixes and security fixes that we would lose if we threw it away and started over. So we did decide to fork. And the only problem with that is lurking down in the bottom of the code base are those areas that are marked, here be dragons. So when we forked the code, we were dealing with a couple of technical challenges. The biggest technical challenge was that, uh, you know, it, it was in Perl. It was a quarter million lines of legacy Perl. It ran under Perl 5.6. It didn't uh, even run properly under more mature versions or more recent versions of Perl. And in 2008, when we forked, the code would only run under Apache 1.3. The Apache 1.3 series uh, was released in 1998. It was not officially marked end of life until 2010, but in 2008, um, Apache 2.0 was well on its way to being uh, the, the proper choice. Um, we ran our, our templating language that was used to generate the pages that the users see was a custom templating language called BML, 
which stands for either better markup language or Brad markup language. Nobody could ever really decide which way. But Brad was the guy who invented LiveJournal, um, and he had used, reused the templating language from a previous project of his. That templating language was created in 1996, and it pretty much got to feature completeness in, you know, 98 or so. And it did what he needed it to do, so he just stopped working on it, and there was no further development on there. We, of course, had a, it being Perl, we had a whole slew of Perl modules uh, that we depended on, usually the outdated versions of the Perl modules, and we couldn't actually update to the newer versions of the Perl modules, because if we did, everything would just complain and nothing would run, and it was sadness and woe. So we thought, okay, we, we've got to really like dig into this and do some of the, uh, pay down some of the technical debt that we had been ignoring for years and years and years. This is the horror story section of the talk. You're allowed to laugh at me. As a matter of fact, I, I would like you to laugh because it shows that you will feel my pain. Some of the things we found down there, comments that don't help. For those who can't see uh, the, the text very well, the comment there says, it's a you know, basic routine. It says, this is hacky. It forces the text flush. See zilla.livejournal.org slash 906. And you look at that and you think, oh, well, actually, that's kind of a helpful comment because it's got a link to a bug tracker. And I can go and read up on the bug and find out you know, why we made these choices. <laughs> There's one problem. That was six bug trackers and four owners ago. It doesn't exist anymore, and archive.org never, uh, ar never crawled it. So that information is lost to the depths of time. We have no idea why that actually happened. We found workarounds for outdated browsers. Again, on the surface, this looks like a wonderfully explanatory comment. Let me explain this. Opera 6 does HT XML HTTP request, but not set request header. No problem, we thought we'll test for set request header, and if it's not present, then fall back to the old behavior, treat it as not working. But IE6 won't let you even test for set request header without throwing an exception. You need to call dot .open on the dot .xtr first or something. Great comment, very useful comment, one problem. The current version of Opera is 30.0.1835.88. And Opera 8, the browser that Workaround is for, was released in 2005. The current version of IE is 11.0.20, and IE 6 was released in 2001. Of course, those of you who work in web development know that IE 6, we're still going to need those workarounds for IE 6 in like 2038. <laughs> but uh, you know, we don't need to work around that Opera problem anymore because Opera has moved on. We found really old HTML. If you know HTML, you are looking at, like I see a couple people looking at that and making the face. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is really old, ugly HTML. In fact, 1999 called, they want their tables back. This is using tables for layout. Uh, I think this was uh, the HTML uh, 3.1 uh, is what this validates to. We found out-of-date special casing. Um, this is actually this is a really useful thing. It goes through when somebody signs up for the site, they have to give their email address. And these routines try to check for typos in the email address, because if people mistype their email addresses, then they can't get into account. And then it's all sadness and woe. Somebody sat down and thought about all of these possible variations and ways that people could misspell their email address. And that's great, and it's wonderful. There's just one tiny problem. These are variations on Hotmail and AOL, and 80 to 90 percent of our signups are from gmail.com. We don't have the special casing in there for Gmail because Gmail didn't exist the last time people were really working on that page. We still haven't fixed that one, actually. It's just it's a low priority bug that uh, I can't even remember if I ever filed it or not. I was too busy working on my slides. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. well, <laughs> let's not even get into that. And finally, we found things that were old, bad decisions that were the correct decision at the time. And this requires a little bit of background. How many of you are Perl people? OK, for those of you who are not Perl people, um, Perl has very good UTF-8 support now. 
in like 2001, 2002, Pearl's UTF-8 support was kind of spotty and you would feed it UTF-8 and it would try to do the right thing and it would fail miserably and instead it would do the exact wrong thing. So in 2001, you know, 2002, LiveJournal was a rapidly internationalizing uh, service and we had people from all over the world uh, writing in all kinds of scripts and they wanted to write in their native language in their native script in order to keep their journal. So we wanted to get UTF-8 support into the code base as quickly as possible and we didn't think that Perl was going to be necessarily doing it fast enough uh, for us. So instead of taking the UTF-8 input and letting Perl handle it properly, we took the UTF-8 input we told Perl, don't even try to treat this as UTF-8, we'll handle it all ourselves. So we built our own UTF-8 processing on top of, uh, or instead of letting Perl handle it. And it was the right decision at the time because it gave us UTF-8 and internationalization support about two and a half years earlier than Perl could have given us. Unfortunately, it's a destructive operation. When we take the text and we tell Perl and the database, like look, don't even try to treat this as UTF-8. You cannot get the UTF-8 flags back from that operation. So once you store the text as with your own uh, processing done to it, you can't then come back five years later, now Perl handles UTF-8. You can't say, okay, we're gonna let Perl take over and handle it now uh, because that information has been destroyed. And it was the right decision at the time because it gave us that support two and a half years earlier than we would have had it but now in 2015, we're stuck with that decision from 2001 because we can't you know, go back and change it. We could make the changeover. Doing that would lose us compatibility with LiveJournal and it's very important for us to be interoperable with LiveJournal to the greatest extent possible. So we're stuck living with this decision. And of course, there's more. But wait, there's more. We found outdated Perl modules as I mentioned, um, you know, there were Perl modules that we were requiring versions of that were so old that somebody coming in to install the code could not even get that version of the module without like jumping through hoops and digging through everything and it was ugly. Um, we found ancient JavaScript because of course back in 1999, 2000, if you want to um, do something with JavaScript, you don't have those wonderful shiny libraries that everybody is using that uh, the problems have all been solved. You had to roll your own. We found massive duplication. Massive, like layers and strata on top of each other. And I'm not just talking about code duplication. There was plenty of that too. Um, things like uh, if you look at the site, there are multiple ways to search for things, both searching for users on the site and searching for text. Let's say you are a fan of the TV show Supernatural, and uh, you know, Supernatural aired last night, and you say, okay, I want to find other people who are likely to be talking about Supernatural. Well, you can go looking for who lists the interest Supernatural on their profile and find people who state that they're interested in that that way. Uh, you can go to the site directory and say, I wanna find people who are interested in Supernatural who are in my area, or who are uh, uh, name themselves as being within a certain age range. Uh, and then when we started Dream With, we were like, okay, we need to have full text search of journal entries, comments, et cetera. Uh, so we introduced an yet another way to search, which is the, the full text index, and you can find people who are talking about last night's episode of Supernatural. And none of these systems talk to each other. We've done some work in order to bring them in together um, and uh, reduced some of the duplication of effort, but not all. Uh, another example is uh, our site admin tools. If you run a website, you know that users do things that you never expect them to do, and you're going to need to do some debugging at some point, like uh, how on earth did you get your account into that state? I have no idea. So when people take certain actions, uh, it will log into the admin table, and an admin, a site admin can come along and look at this table and be like, well, okay, uh, you did this, you deleted this entry on such and such a date, such and such a time. 
Except again, at two different times in the site's history, there were two different separate admin logging tables and uh, admin access areas that were created. There was the older one, which records this subset of actions, and then there's the newer one, which records this subset of actions, and it's only about a 60% overlap. <laughs> and even worse, it's only about a 60% overlap, and in order to diagnose anything, you need to look at them both. So you know, you've, you've just got these little pain points of somebody needed to do something in the past, and they built a new way of doing it instead of uh, extending the old one. Finally, we found, uh, oh, uh, there we go. Bugs that had turned into features because they had been there for so long. I have a lot of horror stories about that. You could catch me later on uh, in the conference and I'll tell you some of them, but I wanna tell you uh, the funniest one. So as a web property, we have a lot of anti-spam efforts because uh, people will want to go and spam things because spammers are horrible. One of the things that we do is anytime somebody submits a comment, we run it through our HTML cleaner to try and strip out a bunch of harmful HTML and also to um, check whether or not it looks like spam. And a while back, I mean, we're talking like 2003 or so, we noticed that um, anonymous spammers liked to just come along and drop links because they wanted the page rank. So we said, okay, we'll just make it so that if a comment is left by an anonymous user, we'll strip it out, links won't display. So if you type the actual link tag, the ahref equals, we'll uh, just print the bare URL instead. And if you're logged in and you drop a bare link in a comment, it will auto-linkify. But if you drop a bare link in an anonymous comment, it won't. So the link does not become clickable. So this was like 2003 that we made that change. Sure, fine, no problem, great. So about a year ago now, we were looking for some deduplication that we could do, doing some refactoring. We factored a couple of different pathways that governed how comments display and uh, consolidated it all into one. We made our code push. We said, you know, hey guys, here's the new code. Let us know if there are any problems. And about, oh, five minutes later, somebody goes, um, I participate in this anonymous discussion community and all of a sudden links aren't displaying as clickable anymore. And I said, well, if you're in an anonymous discussion community, then you're making anonymous comments and links have never been clickable in anonymous comments. And they said, no, they have been. And I said, okay, why don't you give me the process that you go through in order to get the clickable link just so I can follow. Turns out that because of that massive code duplication, there was one view one way that you could see this comment, buried behind like four different mouse clicks to get to it, where it had gone through, you know, it had been cleaned improperly and cleaned as a logged in comment and not an anonymous comment. So if you took these, like clicked these four different links to get to this one view, the link would be linkified. And people who were in this anonymous discussion communities were relying on this because it made links clickable on mobile and they didn't have to copy and paste the links. That took us like a really long time to figure out what they were talking about even because it was a bug and it was a bug that had been there uh, since 2003. I have some other funny stories about bugs that have turned into features, so no. So really ultimately what you're dealing with with uh, legacy code, um, you, <laughs> this is what code comments turn into. For those who can't see, it is a uh, plastic container labeled basmati rice that has cookies in it. So okay, <laughs> if you have older code yourself, you probably have caught yourself asking the question at least once, should I rewrite this? We ask that question a lot with Dreamlit. You know, should we actually take the effort to rewrite this or should we just live with it? And I'm gonna actually talk you through our uh, thought process on two of those uh, separate questions uh, just to give you an illustration of the kind of things that we take into account when making that decision. The first question is, should we upgrade Apache? 
And again, that's upgrading from the Apache 1.3 series to the Apache 2.0 series. I must reiterate, in 2008, we had to ask this question. Obviously, uh, you have to do your cost-benefit analysis. Benefits we got from uh, rewriting the site to use Apache 2.0 moves us away from software that it's the end of life. You know, you, you don't want to keep d relying on that software uh, if you don't have to. It gives you new security fixes that are coming out in the uh, newer versions. Uh, means that you don't have to downgrade new installs immediately. We would have people come to us and be like, hey, I really want to develop with you. And we'd be like, that's great. OK, do you have a, a development server? Yeah, yeah, you know, I've got my, uh, my box that I use for everything. OK, first thing you have to do is downgrade Apache. Yes, I know, I'm sorry. And it was just like, it was this horribly embarrassing thing that we, you know, you, you start out on the defensive with this new person. We're like, OK, look, we know this sucks, but uh, so yeah, the, the biggest benefit to uh, upgrading Apache is no longer being horribly ashamed of ourselves and being able to actually hold our heads up in the, the community. And of course, the decision had its costs. The biggest cost was the time and effort involved. Because LiveJournal was created in uh, the late 90s, early aughts, and was running on a very shoestring budget. The code had been optimized to within an inch of its life, including a lot of tweaks that relied on a lot of the guts of Apache to the point where um, we were using things in Apache that like, nobody else really cared about to eke out that one little bit of performance and of course, the changes between the 1.3 and the 2.0 line, a lot of those internals and a lot of those calls and stuff changed, so we had to change everything with it. It took us six months to do it. And of course, that six months, you can't really do anything else while that's going on. It meant that we had introduced new and exciting bugs, because uh, you know, when you've got 10 years worth of code, that's also 10 years worth of bug fixes. And when you rewrite all that, all of a sudden there's new and interesting bugs that you haven't seen before. But really, this was a no-brainer. We didn't have to think about that for more than about, oh, a day or so. There was that you know, collective wince of, oh, god, this is going to be so much work. But really, we wanted people to stop laughing at us. So, so we went and did that. That was the, literally the first thing we did when we forked the code. Here's a more complex question, which is uh, switching our framework to foundation, which is a, a CSS framework, um, and it gives us a lot of benefits. So the benefits to switching from our old custom templating language that nobody has ever heard of except us to foundation is that foundation is modern. It was actually created in this millennium. It's got a lot of features that are aimed more at modern browsers and the modern concept of the web. It gives us the benefit of a lot of responsive design elements. And responsive design is very important for uh, mobile use uh, and for people who are viewing your site on small viewports. Responsive design will work in both the small viewport and the large viewport. And you can roll your own there, but if you roll your own, then you're losing the benefit of, uh, you know, here are people, other people have debugged this already for you. It gave us better cross-browser cross -browser capability, again, without having to do all that research ourselves. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the talk that, oh, I forget, I'm blanking on his name now, but uh, one of the guys from the Wikimedia Foundation gives a talk about their new visual editor and the process that uh, they went through in order to release their new visual editor, and all of the weird, obscure browser bugs that nobody ever had seen before, but now all of a sudden, you know, here's this bug. When you're using a collective framework like that, other people are also doing that cross-browser debugging for you. Foundation is really well documented. It's not a project-specific uh, system. It's something that um, documentation exists for it. People have written books on it. People have written tutorials. You don't have to be like, I know this is something you've never heard of before and there's really not very good documentation, but just look at the other code that uses it and you'll figure it out eventually. 
so of course this change also has costs. The biggest cost to um, switching to using the foundation framework is there are so many user-facing pages that we have to make this change on. And I mean so many. Um, switching to foundation it often involves changes to the existing look and feel of your site because it's a common framework and that means that you know, it's like Lego blocks that you can uh, click together and build a site out of. But you pretty much can only do what the Lego blocks, what, what Lego blocks you have. That's what you can use to build things. Our users are picky. And when I say, yeah, I mean like, I say that and people go, oh yeah, you know, users are always picky or whatever. Our users are so exceptionally picky that if we do a code release and something changes, we will, within five minutes of releasing the new code, somebody will come along and report that the button moved five pixels. I'm not kidding. And they want you to move it back. Um, changing to foundation, again, it introduces new and exciting bugs. Anytime you're doing something like this, you're introducing new and exciting bugs. Um, a downside to foundation is sometimes it can look slightly less individualized. Again, uh, frameworks like foundation are Lego blocks that you snap together in order to build a site with. And uh, you can do interesting and creative things with Legos, but if you're not really, really careful about it, you're going to wind up with the same Lego house that everybody else builds. If it really seriously, though, the biggest problem was the amount of work. And we started this, I think we started it about a year and a half ago, and we're still like chugging along. Because uh, when you're converting a page, you start out, you're like, yes, I'm going to convert all the things, and it's going to be done, and it's going to be awesome. And you start in, and you do the one page, and then you release it, and the users are like, I don't like it. It moved. Like, OK, OK. And, you, uh, you know, we're, and the users come back, and like, I still don't like it. It moved. So you got to do like, these multiple uh, uh, rounds of things. And it's just, sometimes it's an exhausting process. You've got to make the design decisions. You've got to make the technical decisions. So people get burned out on this really quickly. And so you know, we'll do a segment of the site, and then we will wait for three months and go and hide under the bush, and then come back, you know, like poke your head out from under the table. Like, is it safe now? So this is the, the kind of cost-benefit analysis that you should do when you're thinking about rewriting a portion of your code. And I have a couple of points that you can think about specifically when you are doing that cost-benefit analysis. So let's talk about the pros. Here are reasons that will be in, tip in favor of going ahead and rewriting your stuff. Will it cause you to become more compatible with standards or best practices? Like, we all know the, the thing where uh, you have a problem, you solve the problem, you think it's a great solution, um, and then five or six years down the road, like, the, the tech community as a whole was like, okay, we're going to solve this problem this way instead, and that becomes uh, the standard. So now all of a sudden you solved it a different way, and uh, you know, you're not compatible with the standards. So if a rewrite will get you more into uh, sync with the best practices of the community, um, then that, that's a check mark in the pro column. Will it make your code easier to install? Like, everybody hates writing install docs. And if you don't hate writing install docs, we have a project that we would love to have you come and, and work with us. The easier that you can make things to install, the better because it makes things easier for um, people who are using your code uh, and it makes it easier for people who are developing on your code. Uh, this, is, I, this is like, I really can't understate how important it is to improve the install process. It gets you so much benefit out of it. Will it eliminate project specific systems? Things like that BML, that markup language that was created in 1996 and nobody else had ever heard of. Uh, you know, a project to get rid of that is very, very beneficial because um, it means that we don't have to train new people in this project specific system that nobody else has ever heard of. <coughs> Excuse me. Will it reduce your reliance on institutional memory? You know, if you've been working on the project for a while, you've probably got that one person who's been doing this forever and knows the answer to absolutely anything. So if you're like, well, I don't know why we made this decision back in 
2001. Um, so I'm going to go and ask so and so. You know, I'll, I'll go ask her, and she will tell me. Okay, well, the reason we did this was blah 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 blah. Um, anything that you can do to re reduce the need for people to keep that in their head or to keep it in the docs. Like it's better to document that stuff than it is to not document that stuff, but it's better to not need it than it is to document it. So really what all of this boils down to is how much of a benefit will it have for your users, your end users, or the people who are using your code elsewhere, or for your team that's working on the project. And the, the more beneficial things that it will give you there, the more in favor of a rewrite. Now, it, it, it's not that easy. It's never that easy. Here are some of the things that will maybe come down um, against the concept of a rewrite. Like, here are things that you should, that should throw up the warning sign of caution, proceed slowly. Will it make you lose a history of bug fixes or security fixes? When you have older code, it's code that has actually met real world user data. And as anybody who does development knows, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, <laughs> and no code survives first contact with users. Users are incredibly inventive. They will do <laughs> things with your product that you never imagined. And while they do that, and they're dwelling out here on these edge cases, they'll find bugs that you never tested for, that you never even thought of. So you fixed all those, you know, seven or eight years ago. Um, you know, you should you should think twice before necessarily throwing all of that away. Will it tie up too many of your people? Will it involve too much retraining? Um, with the Apache upgrade that we did uh, way back at the beginning of Dreamwith, um, it tied up like everything. It was a blocker. We could not proceed. Nobody else could work on anything until that was done. Um, so if you've, if you've got something that's that seriously a blocker, if it's going to mess up uh, your team's productivity, if it's going to um, be great, get a great result, but you're going to have to send everybody on your team to like a month-long training before you can figure out how to use this thing, those are all warning flags. Again, it's not a reason not to do it, but it's something that you should think carefully about first. Will it be tied to something that might not last? Now, we're here at a conference. If you've been to many conferences, you've probably gone through this cycle before. You go to a talk, and you learn about awesome new thing. And you come out of the talk, and you're like, that is awesome. It solves every single one of my problems, except this one, but OK. And I'm going to go home right now, and I'm going to implement that for everything. And it's going to be sunshine and puppies and kittens. And, and you go and you implement it. And then two years later, you come to another conference, and you go to a talk. And it's somebody talking about the exact same problem. And they have this awesome new thing. And it solves all of the problems, except that a different one. But it solves the one problem that the first thing didn't solve. So you're going to go, and you're. You can get into that treadmill of constantly rewriting to use the shiniest, newest technology. And that wastes a lot of your time. And it puts you on the hamster treadmill of upgrades. You don't want to do that, especially since a lot of the times upgrades wind up not actually being upgrades. They just wind up being different grades. Finally, uh, you know, does it require you to fork or adapt a standard or a module? And this goes back to the previous bullet point. You've got something that does 90% of what you want to do. In Perl, we have CPAN. It's a, a collection of modules. And in Ruby, you've got gems, et cetera, et cetera. And you find the one that does almost exactly everything that you want it to do, except for that one thing, because there's always that one thing. So you take this Perl module or this Ruby gem, and you take it, and you fork it. And you're like, OK, I'm going to um, you know, put in the other things that I need it to do. Because you know the maintainer is never going to take your patch for what reason or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden, now you have to maintain a fork of someone else's module. It's going to diverge. It always diverges. And uh, so that's yet another <coughs> burden that you have to maintain and, and keep track of. Again, it's not a reason not to do things, but it's a reason to do things carefully. 
So ultimately, again, what all of these bullet points are adding up to is um, how much of a benefit is it going to give your users or your team? And if it's not a huge benefit for the amount of work that you're going to have to do, then think carefully. There is one question that you should ask yourself before any of this, though. It's the number one question on should I rewrite things, et cetera, which is are you going to finish it? <laughs> Otherwise, you get into this situation, the XKCD comic where situation, there are 14 competing standards. 14? Ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. Yeah. Situation, there are 15 competing standards. And that's actually the reason for a lot of the duplication that we found inside the code when we really started delving. Because when we were looking at it historically and archaeologically, um, we realized that what had happened was successive layers of teams had come into LiveJournal and been like, well, these existing systems that we have already aren't good enough, and I'm going to write the Uber system that will do everything. And the project never got done because, you know, a lot of times you only wind up getting 80% of stuff done. And so now you've got another layer on top of the systems that already didn't do everything. So let's talk a little bit about future proofing. You're starting a project now and you're hoping that you are going to be around in 15, 20 years. And you are still gonna be having people contributing to your project and you don't want to be in a situation where 15 years from now, you look at a line of code and you're like, what idiot wrote that? Git blame, oh, right, me. So how can you future-proof this? Step one is comment everything in the code itself. Do not put your comments on a wiki. Do not put your explanation in your separate bug tracker and link to it because inevitably you will have the problem like we had where um, due to natural disaster and uh, backups that we thought were backing up but weren't, we lost our entire bug database. We lost five years worth of uh, that, that data and that tracking. And we were smart enough that in most cases we did have the comments inside the actual code, but we, you know, we did lose some explanation and, and some details. Be grep friendly. And by that I mean standardize at the very beginning on one flag that you can put in your code as notes to self. Um, when we went diving through the code, we found that at various points through the history of LiveJournal, people had used fix me, to do, xxx, um, future, um, there were like three or four other ones that we found. I'm pretty sure there are still some future notes to self in there that we haven't found because we didn't know what we were looking for. So decide on one of them and make it part of your programming standards. Enforce that vigorously. Also, you can use comments to write task lists for your future self. When you do things like put in workarounds for specific browsers, um, you put in a flag, that, a, a grep-friendly flag like uh, browser fix or something like that. Browser fix, colon. This is for IE6 and Opera 8. And so then in a couple years when uh, that particular version of the browser ages out of your browser support policy, you can go through and look at all of those workarounds and be like, actually, do I even need this anymore? So uh, can, can I take this out? Can I fix it? Finally, regularly install or compile your code from scratch. Um, I know it's a pain in the ass, but you got to do it. And by sc from scratch, I mean create a, a new virtual environment that has none of your setup, it has none of your modules, it has none of your dependencies already installed. It's just like a stock vanilla install of Ubuntu or Debian or whatever. Um, install your code. It's going to be a lot faster for you because you already know the steps. Uh, to install and, and configure your code or your web app. But it'll do things like let you realize, well, okay, um, I am depending on a version of the module that is old and out of date, and I cannot actually install that uh, through the package manager. I have to hand build this module, and that's a pain in the ass. So can I actually uh, you know, bump the, the version number of uh, this module? Stuff like that. 
And if you make it a point of doing it regularly, you will catch those pain points before they happen. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. I will take questions.